How's everybody doing? That's a fair statement. My name is Sean Kutzko, KX9X. I'm the Media and Public Relations Manager at ARRL. Thanks for uh, having me out here at the convention this weekend. I appreciate it. Uh, I apologize for my low profile. I uh, picked up something in Dayton and uh, it's decided to stick around a little bit. So, um, so today uh, I wanted to talk with you about uh, National Parks on the Air. And if you had fun with that, how many people participated in National Parks on the Air last year? That's great. I like seeing all those hands come up. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the statistics behind NPOGA, and uh, we're going to get into some uh, ways, if you enjoy portable operating for National Parks on the Air, we're going to talk about other ways that you can enjoy portable operating as well. I know that... Uh, Shell gave a presentation earlier this morning on uh, portable operating, so I apologize if there's going to be some overlap with some of the things that I talk about uh, over uh, Shell's presentation. And then uh, after I'm done, uh, WR80, uh, Ron's going to get up and uh, talk about some of his experiences with national parks on the air, including a trip up to KL7 and uh, uh, up in Sitka. So uh, that's that's something you're going to want to stick around for as well. So. Uh, Bear with my frog-like voice, and uh, we'll dive right on in. If you have any questions, by all means, just uh, raise your hand, and, and we'll get you uh, we'll get you taken care of as fast as possible. So, National Parks on the Air uh, was a big celebration that I came up with uh, with the league to uh, use amateur radio to help the National Park Service celebrate their centennial anniversary. So yes, sir. You're you're taking credit for it. It's what you came up with. Yeah, you did it. I I came up with it. Good for you. Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to acknowledge the fact that uh, there were about thirty people at ARRL that busted their butt to make this thing come off, so they deserve a whole lot of credit as well. But this is the first time that ARRL worked with an outside organization on an on an event of this size, um, and uh, it 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 worked off. Uh, it came off. Pretty darn well. We had a few bumps uh, during the negotiations, but I would say overall it uh, it uh, it was uh, one of the better events of amateur radio. But obviously, the focus was on portable operating. You take your gear out to an NPS unit and you put it on the air. You could uh, do that with mobile. You could do that with QRP. If you could convince them to let uh, let you put up a 100 foot tower and a tripod, you could do that too. We had one guy out in California who pulled that off. That was pretty amazing. Uh, and of course, uh, the event uh, had uh, its roots in the big event that we had in 2014 for the ARRL Centennial, which uh, got a whole lot of people on the air. And of course, with portable operating, it has its ties to field day. And uh, trying to collect all of the units uh, that are available uh, certainly uh, has its ties to, to the DXCC program. So uh, those were the, the three things that uh, really got NPOTA uh, off the ground. So how did we do? 1.1 million QSOs last year from uh, activators uploaded to Logbook of the World. Uh, that's the second highest total of any on-air amateur radio event in history. The only one that beat that was the, the Centennial QSO party in the W1AW Portables event in 2014. Uh, all those QSOs, uh, that was 5.5 million QSOs that was, uh, uh, came up in 2014. So. That's all of you getting on the air and enjoying amateur radio. So, uh, There were 489 eligible NPS units for national parks on the air. 460 of them were activated. That's more than I thought that we would get. Uh, 55 of the 59 bona fide national parks in the country were put on the air. And of, the, of all those units that weren't activated, the only reasons that the other the other uh, 29 weren't activated is because most of them were in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. So, um, I'd say that's a pretty good turnout. Just under 1,500 uh, different activators went out and took their uh, portable gear to an NPS unit and transmitted from it and uploaded their log to Logbook of the World. And uh, oh, about 21,000 folks uh, submitted uh, uh, logs for trying to contact all of those parks and uh, enjoyed National Parks on the Air as a chaser. So about 85% of the QSOs were sideband, 13% uh, CW, 2% digital. I uh, just, uh, Norm Fusaro, W3IZ, and I just talked about this in the NPOTA forum in Dayton last weekend. 
And uh, we were surprised that uh, sideband was as prevalent as it was. We figured that because this was going to be a portable event, and a lot of a lot of stations were going to be low power, that there would be more CW on the air. And uh, we were wrong. So uh, one of the things that we did to um, try to make the event a little bit more manageable in comparison to the national park or to the uh, centennial program was that uh, we made contacts for national parks on the air. Uh, you, you only had to work a unit one time in order to get credit for it, so we didn't keep track of units separately based on band or mode. Uh, and I think that uh, in the attempt to try to make the event a little bit more manageable at HQ, we kind of throttled things back a little too much. And uh, uh, for future events, we're going to learn from this, and I think we're probably going to have other other events that are going to be uh, you're going to be able to work stations by a different mode, and that will probably uh, increase activity in the mode of your favorite mode of your choice. Uh, but 1.1 million QSOs, we got a lot of people uh, interested in portable operating. I heard from a lot of folks who uh, were not very active uh, before National Parks on the Air, and it sparked them to get out and try something new and different. So uh, I would consider the event. An, uh, pretty big success, and I hope that you do too. So what are the lessons that we learned? You know, um, not everybody uh, has the time or the ability to sit in a chair for 48 straight hours for these marathon contests that go on on the weekends. And what we learned is uh, um, the feedback that we got from folks like you is that uh, you want longer operating events. You want an event that uh, you can fit into your schedule and, uh, and put in some time here or there two hours at a time, three hours at a time, whatever the case may be. So that's the kind of model that we're looking uh, looking at going forward. We want to come up with events that allow you to participate uh, within, the, uh, within your own schedule. So that's something that we're going to be looking at a lot. Um, social media, uh, one of the big things that occurred for National Parks on the Air was we created a Facebook group. Do we have anybody here who spent time in the NPOTA Facebook group? Very good. Thanks a lot for uh, getting in that group. For those of you who are in that group, you know that uh, it quickly became a, a, a very big community and there are a lot of folks there that uh, have become fast friends outside of amateur radio. People are getting together as a result of that Facebook group and they're spending time in each other's houses and going out and having barbecues and stuff like that that don't have anything to do with amateur radio. So the role that social media has to play in these longer events is something that was not lost on us. And uh, the last time I checked, uh, there's about 5,600 people that are still in that Facebook group, and we have no intention of turning that group off anytime soon, even though National Parks on the Air ended in January. So uh, they want the community to stick around, and we're going to let them stick around. So The work that was involved with negotiating uh, the event to exist with the National Park Service was uh, significant. Um, but in the end, uh, I think that that partnership worked out very, very well. We uh, used the public relations aspect of amateur radio to show the National Park Service that we can promote their units and their parks in a way that no other unit, that uh, no other organization possibly can. And uh, um, Negotiating with the National Park Service on the federal level proved very interesting uh, and ultimately it turned out that each individual activator that went to a park and uh, tried to transmit from that park became a brand ambassador for amateur radio. So uh, for all of you who went out and activated a unit at a park, you are one of the reasons why NPOTA succeeded the way it did. Um, so the amount of work that it takes to negotiate with those outside groups is significant, but it's sure worth it, and uh, hopefully we can uh, come up with uh, other organizations that uh, we can partner with for some fun events. So what kind of feedback did we get? You know, uh, we got a lot of email at HQ about National Parks on the Air, and it all boils down to uh, people trying new things, people uh, taking uh, a chance at learning something new, uh, people who were inactive for a long time that liked the idea of combining amateur radio with the National Park Service, uh, getting outside, uh, being able to uh, um, get away from uh, their, uh, their home QTH for a little bit and enjoy the vistas uh, that uh, National Park Service units have to offer, and also learning a little bit about the history 
of why those units across the country are preserved in the first place. Um, you know, we have, uh, I'm, you know, I live in Connecticut, up at ARRL headquarters, and we have a unit, there's a unit in the National Park Service up there called Weir Farm. It's the only uh, NPS unit that is devoted to painting. And uh, I didn't know it existed until this program came around and we started poking around looking for places to transmit from. I learned more about painting by hanging out at Weir Farm than I've learned in 48 years of living. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it's fun to be able to uh, find little discoveries like that and, uh, and learn a little bit about uh, why these units were protected in the first place, especially when they're in your own backyard. So everybody's asking me what's next. Poor Ron, he, he got me good, and uh, Ed James got me good. So uh, all I can tell you is that uh, there is definitely going to be something for 2018. We're still working out the details for it, um, but uh, these longer events are clearly a success. Uh, the feedback that we've gotten from uh, hams across the country and, uh, and around the world, they like the longer events. You need more. You you don't need more time in your. We uh, we're going to give you longer events because it works for your schedule. That's basically what it boils down to. Sorry, I'm just not thinking too good right now. Um, so we want something that's going to uh, that you can enjoy at your own pace and can provide the training uh, that uh, you need in case you're called up for a public service situation. And uh, you know, one of the best ways that you can learn about doing amateur radio in a public service capacity is to go out and have some fun. When the pressure's not on, you know, you can enjoy, you can relax, you can experiment, and you can learn. So uh, that's, uh, those are some of the big goals that we have in place when we want to talk about uh, new longer term events. So what do you do in the meantime? Uh, one of the, some of the other feedback that we got from, uh, from uh, folks is that, uh, wow, I really love National Parks on the Air, I'm glad it went so well, but now I'm having withdrawal. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I can relate to that. So um, there are a ton of other programs out there that you can do involving portable operating that uh, you can enjoy while ARRL comes up with something else for you to do in 2018. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. and. Um, there's a, this is a, the, this photo is of uh, Stuart Thomas, KB1HQS. He was the uh, most active activator in all of National Parks on the Air. He made uh, 509 activations in 2016. It's about nine a week. Wow. He had fun. <laughs> so what is portable operating? You know, it just means that you're not operating from home. You know, it can be as, as simple or as complex as you like, you know. I mean, every major D expedition is a portable operation, right? So it just uh, it depends on how you want to wrap your head around it. It can be as uh, simple or as complex as you want to make it. You can do it solo. You can do it with 30 of your best friends. It all depends on how you want to look at it. Um, and there are tons of awards and operating events and all kinds of activities that are out there that are geared toward taking your gear to the field. Why would you even want to do it? Well, you know, the biggest reason is, uh, you know, you, have the, you don't have an ability to put up an effective antenna at your house. I live in an apartment. How many people live in an apartment or a condo? Something like that. You guys are lucky out here. <laughs> so I... Uh, I don't have the ability to put up an antenna, so I, you know, I'm not going to let my living situation dictate how much fun I can or can't have with amateur radio. So I'm going to take amateur radio outside and I'm going to have a whole lot of fun. Uh, you can bring as much gear as you want. You know, it all boils down to how much you want to put in the car or how much you want to put in your backpack. You know, you can take whatever you want as long as you're willing to carry it. And depending on where you want to operate, that's a significant deal. You can operate mobile. Just put a rig in your car. You know, you can operate with ham sticks off the roof. You can pull off to the side and you can use a portable dipole. Uh, this ingenious fellow has uh, got a portable two-element uh, tri-bander that he uses for uh, the Indiana QSO party. And uh, he's set up um, at the intersection of four counties right there. So he's uh, able to hand out four counties with one QSO. And uh, the Indiana QSO party allows you to do that. 
so being able to uh, pack a whole station like that up and set it up and tear it down real quick, uh, if you combine that with an operating event that's geared towards uh, being mobile or being portable, you can have a whole lot of fun doing that. You know, you don't have to spend thousands of dollars and travel halfway around the world to experience what the other side of the pileup is like. Backpack URP, this is one of my big things. Super lightweight stations, you know, some of them can weigh as little as three pounds. Uh, there's a video of uh, the, uh, the goat man, uh, the soda goat guy, who's uh, up on some 14,000 footer in Colorado, and he's using a station that weighs less than a pound, and that includes the transmitter and the antenna and all of it. So um, it can be extremely portable and it's extremely effective. Um, Summits on the Air is obviously a big one for backpack QRPing. Um, if, you're a, if you travel a lot for work like I do, it's uh, real nice to be able to take a super small station and throw it in your suitcase and you know, go set up on the patio of the hotel or a nearby park or what have you. And that's always fun. And uh, we'll get into uh, some satellite stuff in a little bit as well. But uh, there, are, there are tons of QRP groups out there that have QRP themed contests and other events. And they're usually pretty short, you know, like two hours, three hours, four hours. So it doesn't take up a whole lot of your time. And uh, you can set up a small station, and you'd be amazed what you can work. Contests. So, you know, you do your best business on Main Street, right? So if uh, you've got an activity where there's uh, a lot of folks gathered and taking part, you can get on the air uh, as, a, as a mobile or a portable station, and you'll do well because people are going to be looking for you because the activity level is concentrated. So the seven-lane QSO party was just a few weeks ago. How many people took part in that? There you go. All right. So for those of you who don't know, the Seven Lane QSO Party is a big QSO party that encompasses every state in seven in the seventh call area. And the idea is that stations in Seven Land can work anybody and everybody anywhere. And anybody outside of Seven Land can only work stations in Seven Land. And you try to contact as many different counties in as many of these different states as you can over a weekend. And uh, you can. There are so many different ways you can participate in this. You know, you can just go rent a cabin for the weekend somewhere, throw up a dipole in a tree. Uh, you can uh, operate as a rover, you know, and just set up in your car with a mobile rig and drive around and transmit from as many different counties as you want in, uh, during the contest period. Uh, some of these counties are incredibly rare, and uh, for people who are interested in, in collecting counties, your presence in one of these rare counties can make a person's day. So. Uh, I would encourage you, if you are interested in this stuff, to go to the Seven Land QSO Party page at 7QP.org. They have a list of all of the activity level from each county every year they publish the results. So you can take a look at that list and find out which counties are rare in your state. And, uh, and then the next year, you can get on the air and put one of those rare counties on and you'll be very popular. Uh, do we have any VHF operators here? All right, very good. So the big, uh, the big uh, VHF contest is the June VHF QSO party. You hand out grid squares, which are two degrees of longitude wide by one degree of latitude high. And uh, out here in the, in the west, there are a whole lot of super rare grid squares. And um, you know, so if you get on six meters, two meters, 440, if you're feeling adventurous, you can uh, take some of your gear to one of these rare squares and uh, set up portable for the weekend, or you can again operate as a rover and you can drive around and operate from multiple grid squares. It's kind of like, uh, roving is kind of interesting. It's like combining a road rally with a ham radio contest. You know, you, you drive around, you set up in one, one grid square, work as many people as you can, take it all down, drive to the next square, and you do it all over again. And um, there, are some, there are some rovers in the VHF community that have spent a lot of time, effort, and money in putting together a really amazing station on their car. Um, but again, it's all about uh, being transmitting from a rare location. So uh, that's what, uh, you know, if you're in a rare location, that's going to get you a whole lot of attention. And even if you're running low power, people will seek you out because they know that uh, they, need that, uh, they need that grid square for their contest score. Or if they're collecting grids for uh, the ARRL's VHF uh, Century Club Award, uh, they may need that grid square as an all-time new, new grid for them. So uh, in Wyoming here, DN64, uh, 53 and uh, 42. So you're looking, you know, just east of us here in Cody, uh, down here, 
you know, you, as you go along along the range, you know, those are some pretty that's those are some pretty rare locations. And if you care to go up to a high elevation in one of those spots and set up a temporary station for a little bit, you'll have a lot of fun, and a lot of people will be looking for you too. Uh, six meters has been doing pretty good for the last few days. Um, we had a nice opening from uh, DN74 here. Uh, all the way out to Ohio and uh, North Carolina a couple of days ago. And uh, I know that a friend of mine out in California uh, worked a uh, station in the Canary Islands, EAA, on six meters, uh, what was it, two days ago? Or yesterday. Yeah, yesterday, within the last 48 hours. So, <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting when six meters opens up. You can have a whole lot of fun with, you know, a three element Yagi at 20 feet and 100 watts from a, you know, ICOM 706 or an 857 or something like that. If you like Wyoming, you know, it's not only big sky country, it's, uh, it's rare grid country up there too. There's a whole lot of rare grids up there. And there's tons of uh, long-standing awards programs that you can get involved with as well. If you enjoy going out and being the sought after station, there's tons of stuff you can do that uh, will keep you occupied with portable operating. Summits on the Air. Uh, anybody familiar with Summits on the Air? Okay, Summits on the Air is kind of new. It's been around about 10 years. It got started in Great Britain. And uh, the whole point is that you operate from mountain summits. And uh, the, there are regional chapters all around the world that uh, divide it up into, into certain areas and regions. You can do it on HF or VHF. Uh, it is incredibly inexpensive. The views are absolutely wonderful. And uh, you've got almost 1,200 summits here in Wyoming that you can choose from. So if you're interested in uh, backpacking and hiking and doing a little ham radio when you get to the top, you've got a lot of targets here in Wyoming to choose from. So, uh, 254 in Park County. There you go. There you go, sir. And to point out, I mean, a lot of the summits that are on summits on the air are hike-in. Some of them you can drive up and then hike your gear in the minimum amount. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to hike all the way in. Right. You don't, you don't have to be in a condition to climb Mount Everest to do some of these. <laughs> and if you want more information here in Wyoming, uh, your guy is Guy at 7UN. The U.S. Islands program is another one uh, that uh, it's, this, is not, uh, this is not islands on the air. U.S. Islands is a completely different program, and uh, the big difference is that for the U.S. Islands program, you're allowed to transmit from islands that are in fresh water. So you can transmit from lakes, rivers, streams, um, uh, all you know, uh, freshwater islands. So uh, there are about 17,000 islands in the United States, and there are only uh, I think about 3,000 or 4,000 islands that have been put on the U.S. Islands uh, activity list at this point. So. Yes, sir. How big does the landmass have to be to qualify as an island? For the U.S. Islands program, it needs to be 100 feet across from uh, point to point, and it has to be a minimum of 50 feet from the shore. And that has to be at, uh, uh, if tide is involved, it has to be there 24 hours a day. So, uh, And a lot, of, a lot of these you can drive to. Um, but uh, one of the great things about the U.S. Islands program is because only about a fifth or a quarter of the islands in the United States have been put on the list yet. Half the fun is looking at the map and finding a new island that hasn't been uh, put on the list yet. So in many cases, you can be the first person to transmit amateur radio from some of these islands. I've done that a few times, and you know, it's, it's a minor thrill. It's kind of neat. Um, so there are only 21 islands in Wyoming that are on the list so far. There's got to be more than that in Wyoming. So if you want to break out your map and get on Google Earth and do a little poking around, you know, you could be the first one to transmit from an island. Let the folks at the U.S. Islands program know and you'll get a pilot. So there's a video of me on YouTube activating uh, one of the keys in Florida, Pigeon Keys. So if you want to check out what it's like to transmit from an island, just look me up, KX9X Pigeon Key on YouTube. And it's about a seven or eight minute video. Worldwide Flora and Fauna Foundation. This is uh, an organization uh, that is uh, focused on operating from parks and nature areas worldwide. It has primarily been a European phenomenon. Uh, the biggest areas of activity are um, France, Belgium, and Australia. 
but because of national parks on the air, uh, all of the national parks, uh, all of the units for national parks on the air qualify for the worldwide flora and fauna program. So uh, when we announced national parks on the air, all the WWFF folks in Europe said, uh, hey, <laughs> can you please start sending uh, the WWFF uh, tags in your QSOs because there are a whole bunch of European operators that want to work these parks and they haven't been able to get a decent foothold among portable operators in the United States. So National Parks on the Air really saw an explosion of activity in the Worldwide Flora and Fauna Program. So much so that uh, some of the NPOTA activators uh, near the top of the list created a subchapter called the uh, KFF, K for the United States. So there's a new organization that just got started in uh, late 2016 that is geared towards uh, promoting activity for worldwide flora and fauna uh, in U.S. parks. So uh, there are 24 WWFF sites in Wyoming. Uh, Katie and I were just at Devil's Tower uh, for, uh, for worldwide flora and fauna on, what day was that? Thursday? Thursday. Thursday? Sorry. <laughs> it's all a blur. Um, and we were up there for, I don't know, half an hour. We were 25 folks with five watts, worked to Germany with, a, with five watts and a dipole. So, so it's uh, you know there there there's plenty of activity that you can uh, that you can do with uh, with uh, WWF and because it's a new program there's a lot there's a lot of excitement centered around it right now so um, strike while the iron's hot county hunting of course you know there are 3,077 counties in the United States. Uh, there are plenty of rare counties out here in the, in the West. I would like to acknowledge uh, WY7LL for all of his work that he did in uh, promoting county activity in the United States and abroad. There is a County Hunters Net 14336, so you can just tune on to that or uh, take your mobile equipment and set up on that uh, frequency and you'll get called and when, you're, when, you're, when your number comes up in the net, you'll be able to work folks. Uh, this is a this is a very serious activity. Um, one of the uh, one of the major national parks on the air operators is a gentleman by the name of Bob Voss, N4CD, and uh, he is transmitted from all three thousand seventy seven counties in the United States twice. Wow. Last year for national parks on the air, Bob put fifty thousand miles on his car. He transmitted from 263 different NPOTA units last year, by far heads and tails above anybody else from in terms of unique parks activated. He's a madman. He's great. So, you know, you don't have to go to that extreme, but if you want to throw a hamstick on your car and go uh, drive around... Uh, in, uh, in some, uh, on some back roads for a weekend, uh, you can get a lot of activity from that. Uh, you may have an extremely rare county sitting in your backyard, you know, 30 minutes or an hour away and not even know it. So, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Uh, for the VHFers, the Fred Fish Memorial Award was, award, was an award that uh, ARRL came up with a few years ago for working all 488 grid squares in the contiguous United States on six meters. Fred Fish, W5FF, down in New Mexico, was the first one to do it. So far, five others have done it. And right now, there are about 20 hams that need fewer than 25 grids and to, uh, to pull off this feat. Not surprisingly, most of the grids that they need are in the West. So, if you are really interested in six meters, and if you really want to learn more about six meter operating, the, uh, the Fred Fish Memorial Award group uh, out there will be more than happy to teach you how to operate six meters and get involved with uh, some of the more interesting digital modes, uh, such as uh, uh, transmitting um, WSJT or uh, MSK uh, off of uh, incoming meteorites. So if uh, there's no sporadic E propagation on six meters, you can still make QSOs using the digital modes in meteors. And it doesn't take much to do it. 100 watts, three element Yagi, you can do it. And of course the amateur satellites. Satellites uh, uh, that I've been spending most of my time operating satellites in the last couple of years. Uh, it's extremely fun. It is incredibly portable. Um, the satellite passes are 100% predictable. That you, there are numerous websites and, and apps for your phone 
that will tell you what amateur radio satellite is going to be overhead at what time. They can predict it out a month in advance. Um, the, these are all low Earth orbit satellites, so they're only above the horizon for a maximum of about 15 minutes at a time. Uh, it's a great way to enjoy amateur radio and not take up your whole day. Um, there are, uh, there are uh, numerous ways that you can enjoy this. Uh, there are FM satellites where all you need is a dual band HT to, to work it. Uh, there are also other satellites that are sideband and CW based that, uh, that actually have real bandwidth that you can use. So it's like uh, you know, working a satellite on 20 meters, for example. You, know, you can have multiple people using a contact. Uh, using the, the bandwidth to make contacts. The FM satellites are more like an orbiting repeater. Only one person can be talking at a time. Um, but uh, any license class can do this. You know, if you're a technician class licensee and you're looking for something new to try, you know, the FM satellites, you know, you have full privileges on these bands, so you can get involved with this and, uh, and uh, try something a little bit new and exciting. And uh, you can go to the, the you know, grid squares are, are the, the geographic unit that people exchange uh, on the FM sat or uh, on the satellites. Um, Cody, Wyoming, DN54, right here. This is an extremely rare grid square in the world of satellite operating, and uh, I hope to be able to put on a demonstration of uh, some of the satellites, maybe later on tonight after the banquet. Uh, if anybody's going to be around tomorrow, I'll try to do something tomorrow morning before folks leave. But uh, it's it's not it's not difficult, you know. Um, that photo is of me uh, operating uh, one of the FM satellites uh, on the north shore of Puerto Rico, and uh, I worked uh, all the way up into uh, the U.S. and Canada uh, with that setup. And all I'm using is this dual band HT and this dual band Arrow antenna Yagi. So this is three elements on two meters. Seven elements on 70 centimeters. You hook that up to your HT. You're off to the races. You have to, you know, you follow the satellite as it goes overhead. And uh, I've worked uh, on the FM satellites. I've worked about 30 different countries uh, from uh, from Connecticut. Um, yesterday, before no Thursday, was it Thursday? Public Thursday. 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 Was that yesterday? Yeah. Good grief. <laughs> okay, um, so yesterday, uh, before we drove over here, uh, we stopped off at the Gillette, Wyoming airport, and uh, I worked a station via satellite in Spain and uh, gave him uh, Wyoming as a brand new state for him on the, on the uh, amateur satellites. He was so keen when he heard that I was coming out here to to put uh, uh, to do the, the convention here, and I was bringing satellite gear. He was so keen on trying to work me that uh, he actually he actually drove up to a mountaintop in order to maximize his time on, of the uh, exposure to the satellite because the satellite for him uh, he only had a window of opportunity of three minutes, and uh, the the satellite that we that I talked to uh, him through uh, for him was only uh, two degrees above the horizon for him, so. We just squeaked it out, and uh, uh, the contact between Gillette, Wyoming, and where he was in Spain was uh, 7,400 kilometers. So, um, DXCC is possible on satellites. It's mathematically difficult, but it is possible. And from here in Wyoming, uh, worked all states via satellite is certainly doable. So, something to think about, you know, if you want to try something a, a little bit more of a a challenge if you're looking for something to mix stuff up a little bit. Um, satellites are super fun, and uh, you know I'd be happy to talk your ear off about that. Uh, if you want more information about satellites, check out amsat.org. There's a wealth of information there for people who are new to satellite operating, uh, how to get started, uh, how to tell uh, uh, who's going to be if, if there if there are anybody who's going to be transmitting from a rare grid square. There are uh, programs there that you can track all the various satellites. Uh, so you know when the satellite's going to be over in, uh, in your area. Tons of information there. It's all free. So check it out. And of course, special event stations, you know. Um, just just put a station on the air like we're doing here for the convention, you know, w one uh, was it W1AW stroke WY7, right? Okay. So, you know, you don't even need a reason to put a special event station on the air. If you just want to have some fun, just go out and do it. 
Um, my, this, this photo here, this is one of the favorite special event stations that I've ever seen. The 2008 barbecue goat cook-off. You know, you can't get much more laid back than that. You know, so if you can have a special event station for barbecue and goat, you can have a special event station for anything. So, and just have some fun with it. You know, make up a special certificate or make up a special QSL card. Uh, there are tons of hams out there that enjoy collecting certificates and QSL cards from special events because it's fun. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you're not trying to um, make a big score, you're not necessarily trying to transmit from a super rare location. Special event stations are generally all about just having fun. And, you know, you set up a special event station, you learn a lot about what it takes to set up a station in the field, you know. And again, because it's low pressure, the lessons that you learn, the tips that you pick up, the operating techniques that you learn, um, all of that stuff becomes very, very valuable if you're ever called into a public service need. So this is a, this is a great way to have some fun. You know, November 30th, I, I, uh, uh, I set up uh, a dipole in the, uh, in the carriage driveway of the Mark Twain house in Hartford, Connecticut for his 181st birthday. You know, uh, they were happy to have the extra publicity. I was happy to be able to spend a day playing radio. Spent one day there, made 550 contacts. You know, and it's surprising, you know, there are a lot of people worldwide who really like Mark Twain. How about that? So that's really what it's all about. Portable operating is just fun, no matter how you do it. You can do satellites, you can do summits on the air, you can do special event stations, national parks on the air. It doesn't matter, you know. The main thing is just go outside Take your gear with you, try something new, and have some fun. And I think that you, if, 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 if you're willing to try that and you're willing to get a little dirty, I think that you might find a new way to enjoy amateur radio. That's all I got. Thanks. I would be more than happy to discuss any of this stuff with you. Uh, just flag me down. Uh, like I said, my voice is a little shot this weekend, but I'll happily do my best. You can send me an email at the league, kx9x at arrl.org. Any questions that you have, anything that I can do to help, just let me know. I'm going to turn it over. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sean, I wanted to mention this, this special events. Two, two memorable ones to me that we put on this is, uh, I think everybody's heard of Trinity site. We put on, a, on the anniversary of that is, is uh, there's a group of us that goes down and we have permission to operate from ground zero. And uh, not so much anymore, but I can remember this is when we did the 50th anniversary, talking to the uh, navigator that was on Box Car, which brought the second bomb of Nagasaki. It, I tell you, it's, it's it really, so you, the contacts that you make sometimes is as people come out through these various historical sites. The other one was, it was just this past uh, spring, we commemorated the 75th anniversary of the Baton Death March mm -hmm. from World War II. And one of the stations we worked was a guy who was at the time a nurse that cared at Bethesda for these guys. And he was talking about, you know, the, uh, you know, the prisoners as they came back and whatnot. I mean, it was just, it was so stirring. You know, it was just, you, you feel so privileged to be an amateur radio operator at that moment. Uh, so. You know, it's, it's, uh, when you're doing a special event, you know, sometimes it's, it's amazing who comes crawling out of the wood and you just, you're just sitting there listening to this and just, you're awestruck. You're absolutely right. Um, one of the groups um, in, in a similar vein as that, one of the groups that uh, was participating in National Parks on the Air uh, got permission to activate the uh, Rosie the Riveter site in California. <coughs> And uh, on one of their operations, they got visited by three actual Rosie the Riveters who were, uh, who were very active in California during World War II and got them on the air. And uh, they loved it. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty fun. That's, 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 you know, that's not a trivial experience. Any other questions? <coughs> Sir? Would you sign my certificate? Please? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> what did he do now? <laughs> I don't know. Is it? Yes, I'll happily sign it. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to turn it over to Ron WR80 and let him show you what uh, what uh, National Parks on the Air operating is like up in Alaska. Well, I don't have any. Alaska. Don't have any videos. Oh, no video. Sorry. No, no, I'm just gonna. 
read off my computer here, and I'll just keep people up. Oh, could I just a few minutes? Sure. So I, I forgot. Uh, one of the things that I brought here for show and tell is I brought um, uh, the pack that I use for uh, a full duplex portable satellite station with me. So if you're interested in checking out uh, what uh, this is, this is the station that I used to talk to Spain just a couple of days ago. So I'd be happy to show this to you if you're interested. So just come up after the presentation. I'll show it to you. My wife keeps telling me I need to take more pictures, uh, in this particular case I didn't do it, but this National Park thing uh, was a, a lot of fun for me. I really enjoyed it a lot, and uh, I know Sean gave you some of the statistics, uh, but I just, um, for instance, on the uh, number of units worked, it works out to be like 58 units per day. 58 units per day, that's plenty to do. I mean, if you want to get in and get involved and have a good time. There's plenty out there. There were days where there was eight or ten that I wanted, and I was just trying to spend my jumping back and forth, and they were they were all readable, uh, but there was all pileups on each one of them. So mm -hmm. I, I, the amplifier I used was the ALS 600S, which automatically switches for you, <coughs> which was a big help. But I was always jumping all over the place trying to to work all these stations. Um, and Sean gave you the stats on the uh, on the uh, number of parks worked and all that. K5RK was the station that worked all the uh, the most parks. Uh, 460 out of the 489 parks. He worked 100 parks in the first 10 days. Of <laughs> and there were there were stations in in Alaska that no one could hear, no one except him. He was the only one I could hear him. Um, really big station down in Texas. I was using my vertical to start out with, and I was just getting eaten up. I was getting ignored in the pileups and having to resort to funny call signs to try to get in and all kinds of stuff. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. <clears throat> but I could see I was falling behind, getting getting pushed way back. I, have one gentleman here that he and I were kind of racing a little bit, and uh, we're Jerry, WB7S, and uh, so uh, I decided to go ahead and put up a hex beam, and uh, that was a big difference. Made a big, made a big difference, and I put it on an eight-foot Glen Martin tower on the back of my deck, and 30-foot push-up mast, and I could actually hear QRP stations in, in Washington, D.C., uh, what was his name? Uh, Q, uh, HQS. Um, KP1 HQS Stewart. Yeah, Stewart uh, would get on there before he got his his new Kenwood uh, operating QRP, and uh, you could actually hear him with that with that uh, with that antenna uh, trying to get through. And of course, after a while, they get to know you. They get to know the chasers, so they kind of listen for you a little bit and uh, come right back to you. Uh, that's the first beam antenna I ever had in 40 years, and uh, people said it's not going to last. It's going to wind up in Nebraska, and and, uh, and it, all it does, the hex beam, all it does is just dances around up there. And then I also had a butternut HF2V that I used. So even even with the hex, uh, I was still falling behind because a lot of the a lot of the activations were coming in CW. They didn't put out any sideband, and I hadn't been doing CW for a long time, ever since I uh, got my uh, my novice. So, but I was still I could still copy a few. So, this, the exchange was so simple. Uh, you know, all you had to do is send your call a signal in uh, Wyoming, and just listen for your call sign, and uh, they'd send you a signal back and a unit number, and you were good to go. Um, there were times when I was copying up to, which is a lot for me, up to 27 words per minute. And they say, how, how do you know that? I say, well, I, they've got that reverse beacon network. You go on there and listen, and, and uh, any stations that are calling CW that it picks up, it lists them out, and it gives information on how fast they're sending. So there were so many stations that um, started using CW that hadn't before, and there's a couple of people, one guy out in 
in California that really encouraged people a lot to get on CW. And uh, I think we, we, we want to put a bunch of new CW operators, and I think it's for, for, for real, it's forever now. So, and they'll be doing it, and especially if they have, what it was going to be in 2018? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> so, so much for being left behind. I decided to uh, come over here to Fort Laramie. Uh, really uh, important site. Focal point for all the movement. West. People coming out of St. Louis, St. Joe, Omaha, following the North Platte. Getting ready to break off and go on the Mormon Trail, the Bozeman Trail. Um, and there was five different, um, well, I, I was going to use, uh, I was going to use my, uh, mobile antenna at first, and I thought, let's see what I can get away with. So I had this Alpha DX Senior that I, I set up right next to my vehicle, and the Ranger drove by. He didn't say anything, so I just kept using it, it worked out really well. Um, he gave out five different units with each contact. It was a Pfeiffer, and uh, at NS20, which is Fort Laramie, TR07, the Oregon Trail, TR08, the Mormon Trail, TR14, California National Historical Trail, and TR15, the Pony Express. So they all, they all, all four of those trails followed the same route, and when they went through the fort, uh, you, could, you could be sitting in one spot and hand out five units simultaneously. Took advantage of that. I made three. Ron? I made 300. Yeah. Two minutes. Huh? It's a two minute morning. Two minutes. We've got to be out of here by 3.30. They're going to just I can't hear you. They're going to start setting up for the banquet tonight. Okay. About five well, minutes. all right. Then I'll get done real quick here. Uh, we made 307 contacts. We gave out five units each. So it was 1,535 uh, units put out in about uh, four hours. So worked out really great. It went to. Um, I use the 480 SAT, and of course it has the voice module in it. So rather than re you have to repeat all those different unit numbers every time you make a contact. So rather than do that, I just had it in there, and every time I make the contact, hit the button, it it would spray it out, and I'd give it back to him. I'd come towards it, and we're off to the races. I went to uh, Sitka. My wife and I decided to. Um, to go up to Sitka and activate uh, Sitka Historical National Park. It was only activated once, uh, 102 CUSOs before I went up there. Uh, I, propagation from up there is really tough. You know, trying to work those stations. The only guy that really did really well was K5RK. A couple of the <coughs> others uh, were big guns. Um, anyway, my wife went with me, KI7JCR. She got her, got her license. So. Uh, there's a volcano up there, of course, about 20 miles away. It looks like a classic volcano, you know, with uh, snow on the top and, and a big crater and all that. And back in 1974, 1976, one of the local he, local comedians up there decided to haul a load of tires, old tires, up and up into the crater there and set them on fire to, to get them. The local people thinking that a volcano was coming to life. So, <laughs> anyway, so it's Mount, Mount Edgecombe is the name of that volcano. It was a name given by Captain Cook. Uh, let's see what else. Um, the ranger up there, Ranger Ryan Carpenter, called me in advance of that and asked me if I would participate in a radio interview. So. Uh, we did. I enjoyed it. It was a uh, national public radio, Raven Radio, K, KCAW up there in, uh, in Sitka. On the, uh, on the equipment I took up there, I took them, I figured if I'm going to go up there, I'm not going to just uh, go at 100 watts and, and you know, and, and, a, and a vertical antenna and nobody's going to hear me and I'm going to, I'm going to, everybody's going to be struggling to get it and I'm going to be wasting my time, so. I made. I decided to take a Mosley mini beam up there with me. It's. Uh, uh, it has a boom on it that's only six foot long, so you, you can. I could assemble it in here and take it right out through the door. So I assembled it at home, make sure everything was right, and got it adjusted. And then I. They let me use the uh, the theater up there in the, in the visitor center, 
as a as a base, and I I said I put it together there, put it up outside. Uh, longest element on that is about 19 feet. Uh, once it was, like I said, once it was assembled, I just marched it outside, and uh, it only weighs like 10 or 12 pounds, which is a really nice little antenna. It was on about a 27-foot uh, mast just outside the, the visitor center, and uh, no rotator, but we could move it by hand, no problem at all. Real quiet, and uh, thank God, and uh, because typically it's pretty noisy up there. Um, the agreement with the National Park Service would be was no interference with the normal everyday hiking activities of the locals. Uh, so if we had coax running across the uh, hiking path. We had to put a ramp across it, and we had to put warning cones on either side of it to, to make sure that everybody stays safe. Large mountains on the east and large mountains on the southeast uh, pointed that uh, that beam to the southeast and uh, didn't have any problem. Uh, worked at stations uh, into Florida and into the east coast. Japanese stations were pretty heavy coming in. Uh, they wanted uh, Baranoff Island, IOTA NA041. And I got quite a few QSL cards for, on those. Uh, the amp developed an issue and I couldn't take it with me. Um, would have Would have been nice. Uh, because they uh, agreed to let me use it. In one and a half days operating, they did about 475 contacts, most were on 20, and then they had some on 17. Uh, the way to get that stuff up there, I had a large uh, Pelican case, which was about, oh, four and a half feet long, long enough to, that they'd let me, let me check it. Everything went in there for the antenna, the an uh, two antennas, as a matter of fact, that Bosley and the, uh, the alpha antenna that I took with me, it had the, the mast in there, which consisted of 10 sections of three foot long uh, aluminum pipe, telescopic, and uh, all the other stuff, the uh, coax and the uh, um, uh, other uh, stuff that went along with the antenna. Of course, the TSA found that the antenna pretty interesting, the Bosley, I, I have TSA stickers all over it. Anyway. Uh, it was uh, mounted on a tripod for the Alpha antenna. Uh, all the electronics we took up were in uh, two Pelican uh, carry-on size cases. Made sure of that so there's, there's uh, no rough handling on them. Uh, we enjoyed it and um, uh, I'm not sure if I'd do it again, but <laughs> uh, it, I, I have a lot of fun activating. That's about all I have on this. Anyway. Okay, I got a door prize here for 